How to make a Philosopher's Stone. Hey, this is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. You can read the book for free on worldhistorybook.com. Let's start. In this lecture, we will discuss the development of alchemy in Western Europe. We will focus on what alchemists called their magnum opus or their great work, referring to the creation of the legendary Philosopher's Stone. Of course, the Philosopher's Stone is a complete fabrication, yet it consumed the minds of many of the greatest thinkers of Europe for centuries. This makes it a very interesting case from a scientific perspective, as it shows how easily the mind can be led astray without a scientific method. So let's start. In an earlier lecture, I have covered the development of alchemy in Hellenic Egypt, and then in the Arabic world during the early Middle Ages. The Arabic text eventually arrived in Western Europe in the 12th century. And a century later, Western writers already began to make their own contribution to the field of alchemy. Impressed by the scientific advances of the Arabs, Europeans sometimes adopted Arabic pseudonyms. For instance, one important 14th century writer called himself Geber, the Latinized version of Jabir, the greatest Islamic alchemist. And here we see a front cover of his work, stating Geber, the greatest philosopher and alchemist. This Geber figure actually had very interesting ideas about the differences between metals. For instance, he assumed that gold consisted of smaller particles that were therefore more tightly packed. This, he claimed, could explain why gold has a higher density than the other metals. And this is in fact correct. He also claimed that gold cannot rust because the flames cannot reach into this tight structure. This, in retrospect, turns out to be incorrect, but it is nevertheless a very interesting hypothesis, a very naturalistic way of looking at the world. Back in the day, the Egyptian and Arabic alchemists had discussed the creation of the Philosopher's Stone in code words, supposedly to keep their recipe secret, but more likely because they had no idea how to make such a stone, of course. In contrast, the earliest Western alchemists wrote without the usual secrecy, giving us just straightforward recipes of the things that they could do in their lab. This, however, changed a century later in the 14th century, when the use of complicated metaphorical code words reached new heights. In these texts, the reader was just left guessing what materials and procedures these strange metaphors were supposed to refer to. For instance, the flight of a dove might symbolize evaporation, as did the departure of a soul from the body. Here, for instance, we see a depiction of evaporation. We see a figure that is a stand-in for some kind of substance in an alchemical vessel that's heated from below, and above him we see a dove, representing evaporation or the development of some kind of gases or fumes. A potent reaction between two chemicals might be described, for instance, as a marriage between a king and a queen. We see this, for instance, in this curious image. Look how strange. Up front, on the left and the right, we see an alchemist doing the dirty, ugly work in the laboratory. While in the back we see an almost religious scene, a holy marriage between a king and a queen. And we also see the sun and the moon depicted next to it. Very curious indeed. A fox eating a rooster was believed to represent gold being dissolved into what is called aqua regia. This substance is a mixture between nitric acid and hydrochloric acid that can actually dissolve gold. And here we see this being done in a modern experiment. A green lion devouring the sun might represent gold being dissolved into mercury, which is a curious characteristic of that weird liquid metal mercury. And here we see this depicted, the green lion eating the sun. Together, all these crazy symbols form a curious mythology with potent symbols that have inspired artists and thinkers and writers to the current day. The psychologist Carl Jung from a century back famously hypothesized that the alchemist had unconsciously superimposed dream symbolism on the mysterious chemical processes that they saw in their laboratories. These symbols, Jung claimed, 
also appear in the mythologies around the world. He believed these symbols are a sort of instinctual way with which our brain has communicated with us since before the creation of language. Unfortunately, science has not yet progressed enough to either validate or reject these claims. And they're regarded as a bit woohoo nowadays, but I nevertheless think they're valid hypotheses that perhaps someday we'll be able to prove or disprove. An influential early work with these beautiful, famous alchemical images that I've shown you is called the Rosarium Philosophorum, or the Rose Garden of the Philosophers. The 14th century original text contained no images, but in 1550 AD, the text was combined with images inspired by two early 15th century German works called Sun and Moon and the Book of the Holy Trinity. According to this text, the Philosopher's Stone could be created by combining two substances, which they refer to as either Sun and Moon, or King and Queen, Male or Female, and Sulfur and Mercury. Especially the names Mercury and Sulfur are curious here, since it was already known that if you combine these substances, you get Cinnabar, a substance totally unlike the Philosopher's Stone. As a result, we read in the text that these substances do not refer to the usual mercury and sulfur, but actually to philosophical variants of that. And of course, we are not told what the hell that is. And here, by the way, we see sulfur. This is the liquid metal mercury. And here we see what you get when you combine the two. You get cinnabar, a beautiful red stone. The union of these two substances, by whatever name they are called, was symbolized by the hermaphrodite, the dual gender offspring of the god Hermes and the goddess Aphrodite. The god Hermes, by the way, is the Greek equivalent of the Roman god Mercury, and both of these gods, Hermes and Mercury, were usually associated with the Philosopher's Stone. And here we see some beautiful images from that Rosarium Philosophorum. We see a king and a queen fusing together. On the right, they are fused together next to the images of the moon and the sun. Somewhat later in the text, we see their fused body in a coffin, and we see some evaporation going on above them in the form of an angel. To the right, we see the final image. We see that hermaphrodite symbolizing the philosopher's stone, that combination between king, queen, male, female, sun and moon and she's standing on top of what is called the Mercurial Dragon, that we'll discuss later in this lecture. And here we see the same figure, but from another text. We see that combination of male and female, we see the sun and the moon, again the Mercurial Dragon, standing on the Philosopher's Stone. On their bodies it reads Rebis, meaning double matter. And they're also holding some mathematical tools. The whole image is also framed by an egg, which we'll also encounter at a later point. A man writing under the pseudonym Arnold of Villanova, also from the 14th century, became the first to use Christian metaphors to describe chemical processes. For instance, he compared the torments of Christ on the cross with the torments of the material in his crucible. And he also compared the resurrection of Christ with the transformation of base matter into the Philosopher's Stone. And he compared the salvation of mankind with the salvation of metals transmuting into gold. A very curious way of thinking indeed. But things get even more crazy. A man named Petrus Bonus, also from the 14th century, went as far as to claim that alchemical processes could reveal theological truths. For instance, he believed that the ancient philosophers had predicted the virgin birth in their crucible. In a similar vein, he wrote, quote, I believe firmly that should any unbeliever or pagan truly know this divine art or alchemy, it would of necessity make him a believer in the Trinity of God, and he would believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God. So he claimed that just by observing these alchemical processes, the alchemist would somehow know the existence of the Trinity and Jesus Christ. 
And here again, we see that strange combination between the practical dirty work in the laboratory and religion. We see a man praying next to an alchemical furnace. And above we see a vessel within it, the god Mercury being carried down by angels. A very curious spectacle to find in a scientific text. Now the recipe of the stone. Over time, the recipe for creating this philosopher's stone, however strange it was, became remarkably standardized. Only the starting substances differed significantly among various texts. Let's go through the steps. First, the substances were placed in a glass vessel with an oval body and a long neck. This was known as the philosophical egg, the same egg we've encountered before. The name referred to both the shape of the vessel, but also to its function as giving birth to the stone. And here again we see that strange philosophical egg. The opening in the neck was eventually melted shut to prevent the loss of gases, which became known as the hermetic seal, a word we still use to this day of course. And the word hermetic here again refers to the god Hermes the equivalent of the Roman god, Mercury. The egg was then placed in a furnace for many weeks until the substance inside it turned black. This stage is referred to as putrefaction or rotting, or nigredo or blackness. And the furnace at this stage was often compared to a tomb or a coffin. Other images associated with this stage are the crow, the death of a king, and the god Mercury in the form of a dragon. That was the dragon that we saw the hermaphrodite stand on. It is the base form from which the philosopher's stone will eventually be made. Negredo was also associated with Aristotle's prime matter. Aristotle believed that all the material in the universe was in its essence the same and he called that essence prime matter. And here we see an image of putrefactio. We see the crow, we see a skeleton, and we see that black matter below in the center. And here we see the mercurial dragon, this time with stars on his body, in the alchemical furnace. And here another one eating its own tail, which is called the Ouroboros. And here another one in an alchemical vessel. And here we see Negredo in the form of the death of the king. Eventually, the blackness was replaced by a multitude of colors known as the peacock's tail. We see it beautifully depicted in this book. Finally, the substance would turn into a brilliant white color referred to as albedo or whiteness. This white substance was called the white stone and it was said to be able to transmute base metals into silver. By turning up the heat, that white material would eventually turn yellow and then red, or rubido, forming the red stone, which was said to be able to transmute base metals into gold. So the red stone is finally the philosopher's stone. At this stage, the image of Mercury was again used, but instead of a dragon, it now often appears in human form. And here we see some of the stages depicted. We see the blackness, putrefaction. We see the peacock's tail, and here we see the white stone and the red stone, depicted here as a queen and a king. Of course, many alchemists must have known that the entire enterprise of alchemy was a scam. In fact, we have accounts of actual scam artists pretending to their audience that they are making gold. Yet most took it seriously trusting on the expertise of others who claim to have made the stones. Think about it. What if you were a young scientist and you are told that the experts in your fields are these and these and these figures? You then read their own text and they tell you that they've made the stone. It becomes very difficult then not to believe in it. It is the same as us reading in a text that the earth moves around the sun. We haven't proven that ourselves, we just accept what the books tell us. Curiously, one of the people who believed in the Philosopher's Stone was the greatest scientist of all time, Isaac Newton. And he actually spent an ungodly amount of time studying alchemy. In fact, 
We have more notes from his hand on alchemy than on gravitation or mathematics. Very curious indeed. And thus unfolded the story of the creation of the Philosopher's Stone. I hope you were inspired by this crazy story. If you want to know more about alchemy in way more depth, I will refer you to my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read it for free on worldhistorybook.com. See you there.